Hello, everyone. I think we're going to go ahead and get started. Can everyone hear me? Is it too loud? Too good. Thank you for the thumbs up. <laughs> um, okay, so first of all, thank you all so much for joining us for tonight's event. My name is Tamara Schenkenberg. I'm a curator here at the Pulitzer Arts Foundation. And it's my uh, pleasure to welcome and introduce our two guests, um, our two panelists for tonight's program. Uh, to my immediate left is Allegra Pacenti, who is an associate uh, director and senior curate, curator at UCLA Grunwald Center for the Graphic Arts. Um, as well as organizer of many acclaimed exhibitions, um, including most recently a terrific um, show on drawings by Victor Hugo. Um, and then to my far left is uh, Sara Burney, independent curator and writer who focuses on South Asian and Middle Eastern contemporary art, emerging New York City artists, and contemporary printmaking. So please join me in welcoming our two panelists. So we're gathered here on the occasion of one of our current exhibitions, um, Zarina Atlas of Her World, um, which considers the work of the Indian-born American artist, Zarina Hashmi, who prefers to um, go simply by her first name. The show presents a selection of Zarina's work from the 1960s all the way up to the present day, reflecting her lifetime of travel, as well as an ongoing interest in themes of memory, place, and loss. The exhibition features Zarina's work, alongside work by other artists made across cultures and centuries that Zarina has cited as being formative for her vision. For tonight's program, Allegra, Sara, and I will consider the exhibition, but we'll also venture out to broadly consider Serena's life and five decades of her work. So just on a personal note, by the time I started to work on this exhibition about two years ago, um, Zarina, who was born in 1937, um, had already been diagnosed with Alzheimer's. And so she hasn't been able to join us uh, for any of the programs. Um, and given that her travel has been restricted, I really wanted to bring people together here uh, to the Pulitzer who could kind of speak about what it was like to work with her and people who have um, kind of been in her life in different roles. Um, and I was thrilled that Sara and Allegra accepted my invitation and that they're here with us tonight. So thank you. Um, and so for context, um, Allegra curated Zarina's retrospective, Paper Like Skin, uh, which opened at the Hammer Museum in Los Angeles in 2012 and traveled first to the Guggenheim Museum in New York um, and later to the Art Institute of Chicago. And Sara worked with Zarina as a studio assistant, um, actually during that retrospective. And she also assisted Zarina uh, with this book, uh, Directions uh, to My House, um, a collection of personal essays that um, functions as a memoir of sort um, that was produced as a part of Zarina's 2017-2018 residency at the Asian Pacific American Institute at New York University. So um, this book, along with paper like skin catalog, they're um, both amazing resources. Um, and, um, and you can find them on our mezzanine if you're interested. And I also want to mention that just recently, Zarina's family launched a, web, launched a website, zarina.work, which is a terrific and really unique resource for anyone interested in learning more about Zarina's life and art. So with that said, um, I thought we could start our conversation with a quote by Zarina, just to kind of bring her voice in. Um, and I'll read it for us. She said, um, I have made my life the subject of my work, using the images of home, the places I have visited, and the stars I have looked up to. So Sarah, I thought maybe you could help us with this quote by setting a stage about Serena's uh, life and early biography. Definitely, and such a pleasure to be here and speak with all of you. Um, so Zarina was born in Aligarh, which is a small university town in um, s sort of outside of Delhi. 
and um, she was the youngest of four children, and um, both being the youngest and being born to a professor were very sort of, they really, you'll see later on in her life and her work how these have been important themes in her life. Um, and being the, it's hard to give her biography without getting, talking <laughs> about all of her work because her work is so much about her life. Um, but, so this is Rani, who's, who was Zarina's older sister. And this was definitely the most important relationship in Zarina's life, both as a, a friend, a confidant, a supporter, and also as a muse and a collaborator. Rani was so central to Zarina's work. And a lot later on in her life, for example, Zarina actually made a very important portfolio out of letters that Rani had written. And throughout her life and her work, you'll see she talks a lot about separation and sort of missing home. And a lot of it is missing Rani. Um, so Rani has been huge in her life. And this is the house that Zarina grew up in. And this is, you know, university housing at Aligarh, uh, in the Aligarh campus. But architecturally, this house really primed Zarina and her understanding of space. Um, if we can go to the mm -hmm. father's house. So in the time that Zarina was born, it was very common for Muslim households to be gendered spaces. Um, her mother observed um, Purda, which is where the women are always wearing a veil in the presence of men that aren't immediate family members. And so the houses would be divided. There was a female space and a male space. And I think, first of all, it made her very aware of space. And it also made her very aware of layouts. And later on in her work, you'll see she did, um, she thought about the floor plan a lot. So this is a floor plan of her father's house. But as she lived across the world, she often drew the floor plans of the homes that she had made as well. Um, and then to... And thinking about space and yeah. the separation of space. Separation of space, work, but comes the gendering out of, of space. Mm -hmm. Um, and when she was 10 years old, um, the partition of India and Pakistan happened. And this was a hugely important event politically, historically, but also very personally for Zarina. Um, Aligarh was Aligarh Muslim University. It was one of the few sort of Muslim educational institutions in India. And originally the family had sort of not made the decision to go to Pakistan, which a lot of the Muslims in, living in India at the time did, but her family felt very strongly that they were safe in Aligarh. Um, but at a certain point, they got a little bit worried, and Zarina and her mom and her sisters actually traveled across to Pakistan, and they were very safely able to make it to Pakistan and come back, which they did within a year. But that separation, that dislocation, is something that echoed throughout Zarina's life. Even though she was able to return to India, her parents actually migrated from India to Pakistan when Zarina was, after she had gotten married and she was living abroad. And um, then it became very difficult for her because she could not visit India, which was home for her, but she had to visit Pakistan, which even though that, that was home because that's where her parents were, that wasn't home for her really, that wasn't where she had grown up. And being the, her husband was a diplomat in the Indian Foreign Service and being the wife of an Indian diplomat, it was very difficult for her to keep going back to India. So this was a, a separation that continued to echo throughout her work. And then um, I think Allegra, Maybe you can trace sort of a parallel trajectory for us yes. that sort of speaks about the development of Zarina as a printmaker. Well, I, I think I'd just like to first start off by saying this is such a fabulous exhibition that you've curated. And I, it, I was very moved to walk through it because I know that Zarina would love the exhibition. I mean, she, I, the architecture of this space is feels tailor-made for her work. I mean, does, I'm, I'm surprised she actually hadn't ever been here because it just feels so perfect for her and her aesthetics. And, um, and really walking through this exhibition, I really, I just felt that she, her, she was very present. She is, she, she, she's not only in the work, but in the spirit of this place. Um, 
And um, we've heard the biography, which is so intimately tied to Zarina's work. Um, but if we can pinpoint one very important moment and life-changing moment in her life, there were many, but the first uh, was probably when she moved to Paris with her diplomat husband and first touched upon what it means to be an artist and what it means to be a woman artist and what it means to be an independent artist, to stand on your own two feet and make a living uh, by being an artist. And, and this, this, is, this is her in Paris. This Just opened up a whole world for her when she started taking a sort of apprenticeship with one of the great printmakers in Paris called Stanley William Hayter, who ran a, a, a famous studio, one of the most famous in the 20th century, called Atelier 17. Um, Stanley William Hayter worked with the greatest artists from the Surrealists, uh, any, everyone from Max Ernst, all the way through to contemporaries of Zarina's, including Louise Bourgeois and Louise Nevelson. And I'm mentioning the woman because he was sort of extraordinary in that he incorporated, he, he worked with about 200 artists during his lifetime and half of them were women. And in those years, in, uh, he started in 1927 and went through all the way through to the 60s. That was um, groundbreaking. But Zarina and him um, aligned on their scientific backgrounds. Zarina had a background in mathematics and uh, was trained to be an training to be an architect. And Stanley William Hayter had um, lived in the Middle East and trained as a scientist. But he really gave her a platform to explore her medium, explore the materials, and discover paper. Um, there was paper everywhere for obvious reasons. And she really um, touched for the first time what it meant to um, manipulate the paper, to experiment with it, to uh, be very alchemical with these processes. So I think um, the other thing that Paris did was that um, it emancipated her as a woman. Um, she was reading Simone de Beauvoir. She was hanging out with Samuel Beckett. Um, she uh, really sort of came into her independence and that brought her to uh, an invitation to Japan, uh, which was a sort of second mild miles point and important moment where she uh, accepted an invitation, a grant to go to Tokyo and completely fell in love with the culture. And through her connections at Atelier 17, <coughs> met a Dominican priest called Gaston Petit. I think he's on the far um, right. On the right there. Is he on the white? Okay. No, mm -hmm. he's... Yes, with yeah. the striped no. shirt. Mm -hmm. And um, who uh, ran a, uh, a print workshop and took Serena on. She had been doing an apprenticeship also in, a, um, uh, in, a, a, in Tokyo with a Japanese woodcut maker. And then she decided, when her grant ended, she decided not to go back and that this was the most wonderful place to continue forming her woodcut practice. And so she went on and lived, um, found herself a little studio and worked with uh, Gaston Petit. And I think her appreciation of the woodblock, um, although it had started many years before in Bangkok, um, when she was there briefly with her husband on a diplomatic mission, um, it really developed in Japan where, as you know, uh, the tradition of color woodblock making is extremely sophisticated. And uh, I think she, she was challenged by the intricacies of that technique. And she, I always, I always really describe Serena more as a, a carver 
than a printmaker or a, or, a, or a draftsman because in Japan she really learned to carve the wood and um, until very recently she was still gouging her own wood blocks and um, the one thing about wood blocks and and wood cut making that I think is really touched her spirit was that you don't need a sophisticated system um, you can do it on your own in your house um, you don't need a press you can just put a sheet of paper over a plank of wood um, you know ink the wood put the sheet of paper on and then press down with a spoon and you have your wood cut. So it's a transportable process, it's an accessible process, and yet it can do very sophisticated things. And, um, and so that's, that's a wonderful memento of that time. This image on the left Sorry. Um, Here. is Zarina making a, a screen print. Um, I think this is her in Delhi. Up until she was in Japan, she actually was going back and forth with Delhi, so she had a studio in Delhi at the time. Um, if we move on to the next, I think you'll really get a sense of her initial appreciation of the block and of the three-dimensionality of the blocks and of, and of wood. Um, these first works that she made in the 70s in Delhi were literally made of found wood, things that she found on the floor. And you have to imagine herself, um, imagine uh, a, a woman artist in her sari. Um, it was very unconventional for a woman in Delhi at that time to go around and pick detritus from the street and take it back and make work out of it. And, and to consider herself uh, an artist making that work. Um, I, I'm just sort of putting us into context of that time and how radical Zarina was. Um, the work itself ranges from, um, I always say that um, Zarina's work is quietly vocal, that it's, it's, it's minimal, but it has a lot to say through its textures and its forms. Um, it's not your cold, <laughs> Um, the minimalism that is detached from emotion that we know about in America and in Western Europe. This is a much more sensitive form of minimalism. And she's bringing these, interweaving these cultures. She's experienced um, the West, she's experienced um, Malevich, that is mm -hmm. this wonderful presence in the exhibition here, and then she's going back to Delhi and 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 interweaving her own culture into them. So um, the other thing that I think is important to state is her use of different papers. Um, maybe if we move on show? to the next one. Oh yes. yeah, that's um, when I was working on Zarina's uh, exhibition. I. Uh, I, I, I really wanted to understand the making of the paper and that, that the whole um, aspect of um, feeling at one with the paper that she had. And paper is, has an extraordinary presence in India, which is kind of ironical because the climate is not conducive to preserving paper, and yet paper is everywhere. Um, and on my research trip, uh, I'd been to India many times and I'd actually discovered Zarina's work in India, but when I started working on her exhibition, I decided to go to the paper, handmade paper factories to really get a grasp of, um, of, of, of how they function and how this paper was made. And, um, and Zarina herself, both in the 70s and in the 80s, explored this specific town in Jaipur, Sanganir, where there are a lot of paper making families and factories. And, um, and, I, and seeing this paper being made and hung and reflected in the light uh, gave me a completely new understanding of her work. And uh, she often said that she carved the block and then she brought the light into the image. And the light comes from the paper. And, um, and, and, and so this experience of being in these paper-making uh, factories uh, with the light trickling through the paper, and the paper has to dry 
out in outdoors um, really added to that layer of um, understanding of Zarina. And she um, proceeded in the 80s to make her own paper pulp and her own um, sculptures. And these two kind of interweave um, a sort of Western familiarity with minimalism and um, Mughal architecture, for instance. And you have wonderful examples in this exhibition. For example, the Jali, um, um, what do you call those? The um, screens. The sc screens. Um, that is so uh, reminiscent in this work. Um, and yet it's a completely new form that she, 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 I don't know if this is true, but she says that in India they told her that it was not possible to cast paper. And, um, and she studied it scientifically and managed to find a, a way to make her own paper molds and um, or, or at least design yeah. them and then have them made. Yeah, she, that idea of casting paper stayed with her until she came to New York and she went to Dieudonné because she wanted to make right. her own paper. And then when she saw the slurry that they had, she was like, I can make a plexiglass mold. So she fabricated these huge molds and she drilled holes in them so the water could run out. And then she created these, these wonderful uh, pieces. pieces. And I think these pieces resonate um, and do join into this. Yes, if I, if, and and, and, and um, you know, let me know if I'm steering us in the right direction. But um, there is always, even in Zarina's flat work, there is always three-dimensionality. She really sort of brings in, as I said before, the bulk of the wood um, onto the flat sheet of paper, but she's always thinking three-dimensionally. And finally, when she makes these works, she, she really delves into the reality of three-dimensionality. And she compares these to... Um, she, she, she talks of... The, uh, them as, as cast houses. They were in an exhibition called Homes, I believe. Mm -hmm. yeah. and, um, and of the, the real kind of um, her own home having moved around the world so many times and the loss of her homes and the dispossession. Um, I think the paper really reflects that kind of both the resilience of paper and the fragility of paper. So the resilience of our home, the homes that we grow up in, and yet the fragility and the sort of delicacy that um, those boundaries have when we lose our homes or when we're forced to uh, move on from them. And, um, and this moment is also in the 80s very important because she introduces color for the first time, I believe, yeah. in her work. Mm -hmm. um, and yet her colour is not um, is still bound, like her paper, to um, the fabric of her land. So they're all um, natural... Um, yeah, natural pigments. Pigments mm -hmm. and... Um, terra rosa or... Terra rosa, skin-like pigments. Mm -hmm. um, I, I called my the exhibition that we did um, at, at the Hammer um, Paper-like Skin... Um, it's, a, uh, it's a quote of Zarina's herself, but I, I think it's, it describes her work very well because paper, um, like skin, is terrible, um, breakable, injurable. Um, it has that kind of... Um, um, I found a quote for you. If you fragility, <laughs> there you go. Mm -hmm. um, and yet it holds our body together. Um, and it keeps us together, and it is as strong as ever. And so that's how I feel that Zarina's work, um, how the paper in her work um, really resonates. As um, at the same time, paper is something that is on the can you you can bring on a move. It can true. travel yeah. easily. Transient. If you think about her as having this lifetime of travel something that you can bring and with she you. actually did physically bring the paper from india to america and she um she she kept working on paper in the 70s and 80s that she brought decades earlier yeah yeah um, maybe that brings us nicely to this body of work that she makes 
after she arrives to the United States. Um, right. Body of work that's known as pin drawing. So she gets here in 1975, 1976, um, arrives in New York, and um, maybe just so that our audience understands what these are. Sarah, would you mind just explaining sure. how she made them? Yeah, so these are pin drawings and how she physically made these. These are two sheets of paper that she's laminated together, which means they've been run through a press with sort of a binding agent between them. And then Zarina would literally sit there with a needle that she had sort of placed inside a cork, a sewing needle, and she would just pierce the sheet of paper. So each sheet, each hole you see is sort of an act of the hand. And she has, she has I think more than 30 of these. This is a large body of work. And if you think about the sort of time that went into making these, this was really a very meditative, very grounding body of work because she was going through sort of a very tumultuous time in her life at that time. She had just sort of arrived in America. She was living in New York and her husband passed away. And I have to really sort of uh, put this in context um, the kind of family that she was from, the background that she was from, when your husband passes away, you're sort of expected to go home and continue living with your in-laws. And Zarina was like, I had a choice. I could go home and live with my in-laws. I could go home and live with my family, which were the two sort of, this is what everybody expected of her. Or I could continue living in New York. And she decided to continue living in New York. And it was this very sort of bold feminist move, but it was also a very, very difficult decision for her. And these pieces are really a, um, they sort of encapsulate that tough time that she went through. And after she made this body of work, she put it away. She did not look at them. And when I started working at the studio, I hadn't, she took them out when we were working on Allegra's exhibition. And that was the first time that I saw these pieces. And she had said that she actually did not like looking at them because they were such a they were from such a hard part of her life. And to that point, here's another quote by Zarina just to bring her voice in about this moment, about this work, where she said, I had very little money and never wanted to leave my house. I felt eaten away. I took a needle to paper and pierced it repeatedly. For months, I stayed home, made my pin drawings, and thought about my life. I was where I had always wanted to be, on my own, doing my work, but what it had taken, the energy, the emotions, and I was coming to terms with them. So that kind of describes that, yeah. that sort of And she hadn't arrived sort of in a <laughs> vacuum. The, the printmaking community is so global. A lot of the artists that had worked at Atelier 17 had actually transplanted to New York at the same time as well, specifically Krishna Reddy, who worked with Stanley William Hayter to sort of establish the viscosity and he was very important in the printmaking world and he had just moved to New York as well and there were, everyone was working at the Robert Blackburn Printmaking Workshop and the Feminist Art Institute was happening. So there was all this very exciting sort of art activity that Zarina had always sort of longed for but then she'd sort of gotten there at this very difficult time in her life. And I think it's also important to say that the, there's one principal body of the pin drawings that is, how many are there in the Google? 20. Room? So yeah. that she insisted all the way that they stay together as one piece. And, um, and to see them all together really reflects the meditative quality that they have and the sort of almost... Um, uh, this, the, the, the moment that Zarina was living at the time and, and, and the way she, she found a way to um, be at peace uh, with her husband's, at that point, almost uh, passing away, mm -hmm. and um, with her presence in New York uh, as an alien um, within a community, which we'll talk in a little bit, mm -hmm. that was both... at at one point um, welcoming, but at other points also very um, hostile. And so to throw herself into a work that had such a meditative um, and time-consuming quality, um, I think 
uh, says a lot. And to see these pin drawings all together, you have a, a sense of them here too with those four together. They're so fully immersive and um, all englobing and all encompassing. And they, there's something very um, um, awe-inspiring about mm -hmm. them. Because you know, once you start looking at them, they're so rich and your eye doesn't really rest. Right. And then when you think about the effort that it would have taken her to produce something like that, and it doesn't feel random, although one wonders how she's able to create these yeah. designs. It's mm -hmm. very rhythmic and very kind of zen-like, as you say. Um, but to maybe pick up on this moment when she's making the pin drawings, when she's arrived in New York, like you said, she enters into these different communities, and one of them, are some feminist circles that she encounters. Um, and I thought um, it would be good for us to talk about Serena's involvement with um, the feminist circles at that time. I think one of you mentioned she teaches paper making at the um, New York Feminist Art Institute. Um, and then most notably, she co-curates an exhibition, um, sort of now considered a groundbreaking exhibition at the AIR Gallery with Anna Mandieta and Kazuko Miyamoto, um, titled Dialectics of Isolation. Um, <clears throat> and it's, it's a sort of a groundbreaking exhibition because it, it introduced global perspectives and it foregrounded work of women, of artists of color, um, into sort of mainstream feminism at the time. Um, and then on your right, you see an issue of um, a mag magazine, Heresies, um, feminist publication on art and politics, that she, uh, an issue that she co-edited in 1979 um, on the subject of, as you can see, third world women, the politics of being other. So, I think it would be great if we could consider this history and try to unpack what this moment was like for her. Um, yeah, I mean, there's so so many. Um, and maybe I can ask one more question, which is I've always been interested uh, about how this reflects and does it reflect onto her work. Because like you said, she moves, uh, she decides to stay in New York, yeah. which is kind of a radical act. She's not going to her father's house or to it's her husband's. hugely radical. Right, she starts going by Zarina, not yeah. Zarina Hashmi, so she's kind of rejected her father's name and her husband's name yeah. in a way. Um, she's you know, involved with the AIR galleries, you know, all of these things one would think, okay, what does the work look like of a person who's participating in these activities? So I also maybe want to touch on if you see that reflected in the work. I mean, the work, there's the work and then there's Zarina the personally. Sure. And mm -hmm. I think um, there are different things happening at this moment. And um, I think it's, it's, it's a very, uh, you know, it's an explosive moment for women in terms of their own emancipation and, and feminism. But it's a much more complicated issue for Zarina as a, an Indian woman um, in New York in, at this moment in time. And although on the one hand, it's a great time for her to be in New York and to gain that independence, on the other, the truth is that she was also the victim of um, racism and um, even within the feminist group, it wasn't always as welcoming as one would think um, or one would expect. Um, there was a lot of hostility within it. Um, I think she was she was so sturdy and so um, she's always been um, so independent-minded that she she self-assuredly stood up to those hostilities. But I think it's important to keep them in mind that it's not this time where you know, women were doing anything they wanted and they were open to other women. There was a lot of uh, difficulties among that group and, and Zarina was a victim of it as well as a, uh, as well as a benefit of it. She was also a victim of it. And, and her work um, mm -hmm. in parallel to that, um, it's, a, it's, it's an interesting moment Oops. because she, she definitely has a lot in common with the process mm -hmm. art uh, movement. Um, Eva Hesse comes to mind. She did visit yeah. the retrospective of Eva Hesse. Um, 
Sol Lewitt definitely comes to mind. She was a great admirer of Dorothea Rockburn. Um, but she also anticipated a lot of this work in her own uh, work. So she's not actually, she's not copying anyone and she's <coughs> preserving her independence throughout this period. Mm -hmm. And she's making work that is very much in parallel to um, work that is being made in New York at that time, but it's also very different in terms of its textures and its messages. Yeah. Um, it was a, just piggybacking on everything you're saying, I think as a South Asian woman, she occupied this very unique space where, you know, she wasn't white and she wasn't African American. She was in this in-between space. And I think there was a, um, somebody at the UN at that time, she told me the story had said that Indians were honorary whites. And that upset everybody. It upset the Indians, it upset the African Americans, it upset the, the white community. And so she really was sort of in this space sort of alone within the feminist circle because there, there weren't that many other Indian women artists that were living in New York and working and participating. And Anna Mendieta was a very, very, very dear friend to her. She, they, would, they were really best friends. They would talk all the time. And so the feminist circle, was, I think it was Anna that kind of kept her sort of glued in socially, but Zarina always had a very sort of strong internal compass for her aesthetic, which didn't really waver with what else everyone was creating around her. And this happens throughout her life. When she is in India making those beautiful woodblock prints, the Indian artists at that time are doing very large, colorful painting, sort of picking up on the themes, folk themes in Indian art. And Zarina is this sort of random outlier who's making this quiet, restrained work. And so the fact that it keeps happening when she's in New York is very sort of true to her practice. And I think the one outlier in her practice about that sort of non-feminist looking work is this piece, which is one of the 36 woodcuts that's in <laughs> Home is a Foreign Place, which is in the galleries here. And this is actually an homage to Anna. Um, Anna Mendieta has a beautiful work that I think she's very famous for, which is just her handprints. And during their very deep friendship, Anna passed away under those horrible circumstances. And Zarina created this work as an honorarium to her. Which is titled Despair. Yeah, kind of it's titled Despair, of Appropriately, <laughs> yeah. Um, and, and maybe just to also say um, that during this time, and also after, she's sort of overlooked by the art establishment, too. Like I mentioned, she co-curates this show, but really, uh, you know, in terms of her exhibition history, if you look, there's all these major gaps in your exhibition. The retrospective only happened recently in 2012, so. Yeah, I mean, the, 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 uh, there are many answers and many, <laughs> many ways to see that, but um, first of all, Zarina was an incredibly devoted teacher and she, um, she never put her, st her students and her work after her own work. I mean, it was always the students come first and her work came first. So I think that took away a lot from her own practice. Um, and then there was the fact that she sort of fell through the cracks of our history mm -hmm. for a long time. Um, it, and so when I came across her work, she um, was already very much in, her, in, in the last phase of her career. Um, but having said that, she was very famous in India. I mean, yeah. She, yeah, she's she, the it superstar. Was, it was, I was coming to her from a very, uh, from, from my sort of Western perspective, but the truth is that in India she has a huge following. She did when I came across her. I didn't discover her. I mean, in India she was um, admired, interestingly, by every generation. Um, from the youngest artists through to the oldest generations mm -hmm. of artists, and um, and 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 so it was it was sort of eerie to be in her studio in New York, not having 
ever come across her work in America and then be in India where she was sort of um, revered. Um, there would were you say things. that's a more recent, relatively recent phenomenon or you know, has that been had that been she's happening been during the 70s in, or she's been 80s. known in India for and but again it wasn't she was never sort of like this grand art star she just slowly slowly started building this uh, presence and reputation and a lot had to do with how generous she was to artists from India who would come to America or that were in Paris like she was very generous in creating opportunities for other artists just welcoming them connecting them and that sort of, you know, that sort of karma pays you back. <laughs> and so she was very well known in India, even though she didn't live in India, which is very interesting. And even um, sort of, not today, but sort of 10 years ago, um, where the Indian, sort of 20 years ago, the Indian um, sort of art scene really exploded in New York, both commercially and sort of in, at institutions, Zarina was still sort of straddling that world and before because a lot of those artists are sort of diaspora artists and she's like, that's not the diaspora I'm talking about. I'm talking about the, the first partition of leaving India and, and the India and Pakistan separation, not sort of growing up in the West without India. I grew up in India and she always very, very sort of vehemently hung on to her Indian nationality. And it wasn't until she was, gosh, I think it was in the 1990s that she became an American citizen because it was very important for her to still be an Indian and a Muslim Indian so she could be a role model to other sort of Muslim Indians who were both living in India and coming abroad that you could sort of maintain that duality. So, you know. And I think all those travels and all those influences and all those people she touched gave her such a cosmopolitan perspective. And she was not only interested in visual arts, but one striking thing that I came to in working on this exhibition is just to see how much she loved arts, you know, with a writ large, um, including architecture. I mean, she was never really trained as an artist until Atelier 17. She studied mathematics, statistics, she wanted to become an architect. But there's also this love um, of language, of, uh, of film, um, and I think we can maybe get to that through an anecdote that you told me, Sarah, when we first started working of what happened when you showed up to work for her. <laughs> So when I started working for Zarina, and it was totally a, a nepotism hire, the fact that she even asked me to join her studio. Um, we were at the gallery, which I used to work at, and one of her prints was out there, and I mentioned that, oh, my family is also from Aligar, and she was very interested all of a sudden, and then I was invited to, you know, just, initially all I did was help her with her emails. She would dictate emails <laughs> to me, and I would type them up. Um, but within my first week of getting there, she sort of referenced, I think, Foucault or something. And I was like, oh, uh, I, haven't read, I haven't read his work. And she was appalled. She was completely appalled. And I was like, oh, well, you know, I got a studio art degree. I didn't study philosophy or anything. And she was like, I taught studio art and all my students got a reading list. And then she proceeded to give me this reading list. And it didn't end there. She would... She would be like, okay, so now you have to read this one. And then when I would come back to her studio, we would discuss it. And she would sort of challenge me on why I didn't like it or why I liked it. And it was just the most amazing education ever to spend so much time with her. And it, it didn't just and end There's also at, a film list. Yeah, I had a film <laughs> list I had to watch. And every time, every month when we'd get the new issue of art forum. She'd be like, okay, what are we going to go see? And she forced me to go see art. And I think one of the most interesting things about the way she consumed art is if she felt like she didn't like an artist's work, she felt even more that she had to go see it. And she said, we have to go challenge why we don't like it. We have to be able to explain why we don't like it, what we don't like about it. And she really lived and breathed and consumed art. She was a voracious reader, and she read in multiple languages. She read in Urdu all the time, which is sort of a disappearing language, but she read in Urdu, she read in English. When she moved to Paris, she read Simone de Beauvoir in French. She taught herself French, and she learned to speak, uh, read in French. And she was always watching movies, going to see art exhibitions, and it was, she really 
Working for her was such an education on how an artist lives. And I think that kind of brings us to this show in a way because that was the starting point for me just to discover that, yes, um, her life story, those journeys are a really important way in which one could read her work, but there's all this intellectual engagement that she, you know, really cultivates over the years that helps maybe point out to something else that's equally biographical but puts her in touch with all these different distinct artistic traditions across different countries um, and centuries. And another thing that I, I found was really important for me for this exhibition was this quote um, that really opened it up um, that says, when I came to live in New York in 1975, some people started associating my work with minimalism. Curators and critics like to explain an artist's work with language that they are familiar with. Today, there's still very little knowledge in the West of the cultural history of the world I come from. We don't have the fluency to be able to talk about people who come from different cultures within contemporary art historical discussions. Everything has to be explained within the rhetoric of existing paradigms. Um, which really, of course, I too came um, to her work with the knowledge of minimalism and post-minimalism and um, you know, modern Western art, but, um, which, which she embraced as well. But um, here are the two works that are in the exhibition. On the left, uh, a jelly a window screen from the 1500s in India, and on the right, a drawing from the 1920s by Malevich. And it's interesting to see how she bridges um, these two very different traditions, but still, you know, just sort of a reminder that, you know, geometric extra extraction was not invented by um, an artist in the West in the 1920s, and she's sourcing, sort of synthesizing all of those into a very distinct artistic vision for yeah, herself. Yeah, and that was, it was very important to her because so many people made that mistake where they would look at her work and the first reference that they would make is Malievich or the, sort of the, the big boys of minimalism. Um, but for her, her eye was shaped by living in India and when she was younger, they lived close to um, old Mughal monuments and she would visit those architectural sites and she always says that that uh, experience really primed her for not just minimalism but also abstraction because Islamic art is non-figurative so there's a lot of pattern work but it's also very very restrained and it's it was very important for her, for people to recognize that minimalism was not created by the West, or it didn't just exist in Japan, that it also it had an Islamic quality to it. It's interesting also to see how she translates that aesthetic. Like you said, it's not cold minimalism, but it comes with a lot of texture and um, emotion. Yeah, I think it's worth um, remembering her friendship with Nazreen Mohammadi in mm -hmm. India too because that's another artist who worked with minimalism that was um, kind of the pared down language of form or, yes mm -hmm. uh, in India mm -hmm. um, and yet um, like Zarina was uh, had a lot to say about it I think she says um, she took out the maximum out of the minimum or <laughs> something like that. I can't, there, was, there was a quote, um, yeah, she takes the maximum out of the minimum. I think Zer you can say the same thing about Zarina. Mm -hmm. um, it's, it's a different form. But I think it's important to place all of this in its own time. I mean, in, in our contemporary world of art we we're accustomed to the diasporic artists we are all coming from somewhere else um, moving to America moving back to our own countries and moving working with artists who've um, our residencies here from uh, the Middle East for us when Zarina came it was very very unusual um, and and so I think it's always important to really um, think of her as a kind of precinct. She's sort of a forerunner of, um, of our, our art world today where the diasporic artist is, is, is a common form. Mm -hmm. you know? and, and she has such a global outlook, which, like you said, it's sort of the norm today in a way, but for her so, time... So that quote that you... Mm -hmm. That's very interesting that you read, 
um, is a quote that hangs on to her time, but is not really valid, wouldn't be really valid mm -hmm. for today's mm -hmm. time where we're all exchanging cultures more, more commonly for mm -hmm. us. I think that's what made it so hard for Zarina was that she was um, she was somewhat alone in mm -hmm. her messages, which would have also made it very difficult for the audiences back in the day to kind of connect with her work right. because the frames of reference are so wide ranging. Right. Um, right. Um, maybe in the remaining uh, few minutes, we could talk a little bit about your personal um, the relationships to Zarina. Um, Sarah, would you mind just talking about what it was like to be in Zarina's studio, what she was like as a maker? Yeah. Um, well, I think sort of to go back to something Allegra referenced, Zarina was, she was a maker, but she was first and foremost an educator. And she was making her art, but it was also very important for her to everyone who was sort of assisting her in the studio. She was always educating us. And as a maker, and while I was at Zarina Studio, I was also um, at the Robert Blackburn Printmaking Workshop. That's a community printmaking studio. So I was immersed in two printmaking studios. And I have never come across an artist who understood their materials quite like Zarina. She would talk to me about the fibers of the paper that she was using. She could break down the chemical makeup of the ink, the terra rosa pigments that she used for her cast paper. She had all of those samples and she brought them out and showed them to us. So as a maker, she was such a process and materials oriented craftsman and she loved referring to herself as a craftsman because um, she often felt because she didn't go to art school she was sort of an outsider even within the art circles in India because most of the artists that came abroad and settled in New York and they were you know getting a lot of recognition they had all had the similar sort of trajectory of the schools in India, whereas Zarina sort of figured out how to do everything herself. She went to these paper making factories and she was talking to the craftsmen, the laborer who were making these um, wonderful organic handmade <coughs> sheets of paper. So um, her studio was this brilliant, it's almost like a little, it was a laboratory. Well, there it's was a studio and a, an apartment that she lived in and since an she moved to, the, to yeah. New York. Yeah. I mean, I think it's important to put that into context too, that uh, Zarina for over 30 years lived and worked in a space not bigger than this, yeah. this area. And she stored an entire lifetime of work in that space. Um, she slept there, she bathed there, she ate yeah. there, she cooked there, she did her studio visits, she had tea ceremonies. Yep. Um, and it was literally not bigger than this space. And um, she worked um, with Sarah in that space and with a wonderful Japanese assistant who I think had a lot uh, to do with that sort of very rigorous Japanese style story. I mean, she could only... I mean, the storage, <laughs> the sophistication was, of the which storage. Which you can see on was, the right. Yeah. With with all of the prints. Yukari everything. helped make those yeah, boxes. They were the original Marie Kondo, those two. Kudos you know, to The Yukari. way they did yeah. everything there. Um, and, and also the work that's in the show, um, yeah, Veil, so this is, is in the foreground. This piece that is on the table here, this is Veil that's hanging up in the galleries. And so I was at the studio when we were making this and the stu we couldn't even, we didn't have space to roll the whole piece out. We only worked on it on the table like this. And when I, that was walking through the galleries, that was the first time I'd seen this piece hung up and in its entirety. And it was <laughs> such a sort of touching moment. But this space, this tiny space, was such a serene, serene, sort of sacred space for all of us who were lucky enough to pass through it. And it's, it's phenomenal. They had everything stored away. They still have a lot of her works now. She's making collages and works on paper. And she'll pull out scraps from prints she did in Paris. And she's still got them. And she's going to weave them into a collage. It's, it's really a beautiful use of material. And Allegra, maybe you could help close this off by talking about, you know, your encounter with Serena and what, what it was like to, to work with her and collaborate on a show as a curator. Um, well, I mean, it was an extraordinary journey 
in so many ways. I, um, I'll give you a little mini background. I, I, I first came across her work. I, I, I first saw her work mentioned in a in a in a in an advert. Um, I was in Calcutta, and sh and I picked up a newspaper, and they were talking about an exhibition in Delhi on an artist who worked in a minimal form but with paper. And because I'm a paper curator, it sort of tweaked my interest. And um, and I went to see the show, and I was completely mesmerized by it. It wasn't her woodcuts. It was her uh, paper, cast papers. It was an exhibition of her cast papers in her gallery in Delhi. And um, and I made a sort of mental note of the work because I was I I, I hadn't seen anything like it and I, I I knew that it was something that I wanted to explore further, and then I moved to LA to uh, work at the Hammer Museum and um, my first exhibition at the Hammer was a survey of the woodcut medium called Gouge, and um, as I was working on Gouge I received a. a an email from a gallerist in New York uh, saying that she'd heard that I was doing a woodcut exhibition and would I be interested in seeing the work of an Indian artist that she represents. And um, and so she, I said, of course, you know, and she sent me a, a package of information and it was only then that I realized that that artist was the same artist that I'd visited, um, that I'd seen in Delhi. It took me a couple of months to realize that it was the same person and I was completely um, surprised to learn that she'd been living in New York for 35, over 35 years. And so when I arranged to go and meet her, um, this is something I learned, you don't just go in for a one hour studio <laughs> visit, it is a day, couple of days experience. Um, but to my complete surprise, um, I went in to just see a few woodcuts and I ended up seeing an entire lifetime of, of work in that little space. And as um, Sarah was saying, the stories are abundant. Zarina is a storyteller. And, and the stories just, I mean, I was, I could have stayed for months on end because they were so, um, they, they were like, some were like fairy tales and some were just um, actually real sort of difficult life uh, stories. Um, she recounts her, her road trips from LA to New York in a little car on her own in a sari. And so you can just imagine her going through the desert, driving through Texas. And these stories gave life to the work that um, then became her exhibition. Um, there's these, some of her works are cocoon-like, um, and like that, that series of, this series of rubbings um, of a cocoon on the left. Um, they're reminiscent of a, of, of a very story like that of Zarina saying, you know, because I, I, I asked her, how did you manage on your own in these long road trips an alien um, in this land? And she said she would find herself in these vast expanses of desert. And the only way she um, could live through it is to imagine an invisible cocoon around her almost like a glass box um, and that that was her home and that beyond it was the world but that she was protected so that sort of cocoon like form um, comes up a lot in the exhibition and I tried to um, I tried to um, evoke that as much as possible that sort of protection of the home um, that you carry with you whether it's your car whether it's a tent, whether it's your actual brick and mortar home. Um, my experience in installing the exhibition was absolutely wonderful because she gave me complete freedom and there was nothing um, conventional that I needed to do. I could hang one thing right at the top of the ceiling, one thing right at the bottom. I could um, spread the works out. I could put them on the floor when they actually belonged on the wall. She was completely um, excited also to see her work communicate in different ways in different places. So we did different things with the work. When it came to the Guggenheim, we played with the curves. 
Um, we designed new um, furniture for it. And so essentially we sort of told three different stories in the three different museums um, it lived in. And that was the wonderful aspect of Zarina is that although she's extremely opinionated and maddening and you could get into these huge arguments, <laughs> she was also this great... Um, a lover of freedom and um, and as Sarah was saying this fantastic teacher and, and mentor um, maybe this is a good image to end on, on that well that's a very interesting I'm sorry it's such a bad snapshot of mine but um, this is Zarina at the Hammer where the show opened and the work she's looking at is um, this is another example where I had I, I sort of um, took a bit of uh, artistic liberty in the exhibition but she She, uh, she, she, she's looking with her students at the first ever block that she carved. Um, and it's actually a really bad work. <laughs> she is completely naive. It's, of a, it's the only figurative work she's ever made. It's of a, a, a rice paddy worker with a pointed hat in Bangkok. Um, but it's on a plank of wood and, she, she, and, she, and it's the first experience she ever had in modeling uh, and carving a piece of wood and I, I said you know it's, this is actually an important moment so let's let's include it in the exhibition and um, and lo and behold it sort of became a little meeting point in, in the exhibition. So we were so it. surprised when she agreed to that because she would keep she was very sort of ruthless in sort of editing her her practice and this early work, which she calls her student work. She didn't, she didn't feel like it referenced her later career at all. Um, but I'm so glad that you prevailed well, it when was you nice asked her to. It was, I think it, it makes a difference that it's the actual block. It's not yeah. a print from the block. It's the actual physical object that she first approached. That she could teach from. That she, like you said, yeah. was the lifelong through line yeah. in her life. And I think that ties in actually really nicely to your exhibition because these objects, even though she edited the print out of her practice, she held on to the object. Mm -hmm. And that's something I think that's so magical about your show is the sure. objects that she kept around her. You've brought some of them in. And I think it's really important to contextualize her work against what she treasured. Um, If you need to leave, please feel free. Uh, we're at time, but if there's any questions, we'd be happy to take a few. Yes. Is there a microphone that we want to pass around? I think for the purposes of the recording, if you don't mind just Thank you. using the microphone. Thank you. Well, congratulations for the exhibition. It's very beautiful, and it's a wonderful opportunity to listen to the three of you. Um, it's very complex to go through the work of someone of such uh, multifaceted creativity. And uh, there's one word that I haven't heard in all the richness that you have shown, um, which for me has a lot to do with this image, um, that there's a, an anthropological character to the work that she has done in bridging all these cultural differences, her internal world with the external world in which she lived. And um, I agreed with everything until the, the moment in which Allegra said that this is bad, that this print <laughs> is bad. Because it, it contradicts. she says it herself. Yeah. I'm it, not that. I, oh, oh, but it contradicts that quote from 1975 in which she says that the world is not prepared to leave its paradigms mm -hmm. to, you know, that are ready to interpret this, this work. So I think that there's something very fresh intellectually and artistically in showing this, which has yeah. to do with showing the practice and showing it uh, as such, uh, which for me has a profound well, anthropological meaning. So I was wondering what you think about that. Well, I think um, anthropological, maybe, perhaps not a word I would use, um, Uh, one, one aspect of her work that we haven't touched upon and that is really so important and prominent is the political aspect of her work. Um, so there is an anthropological side, but I think it's sort of countered and, um, um, and almost embattled with this huge um, political... Um, uh, she, she was a... a 
constantly looking at the news, reading the internet. She was up all night. Um, she was extremely aware of what was happening in the world and aware of... Um, uh, she was very much affected by September 11th for obvious reasons. Um, so I just wanted to put that in because we hadn't spoken about that. Um, but in terms of this work and, and, and anthropolo anthropo anthropology, um, yes, uh, you know, she comes to Thailand and she discovers this, this, this field. Um, I think in terms of including it in the exhibition, it really shows how brave she, is, she was to just say, well, you know, this is my beginning, let's, let's put it in here, and it also represents these different layers of culture that are in my work. Any, any other questions? Wasn't there another question up at the top there? No? Well, thank you all for coming. Um, the exhibition is up through this Sunday, as is our um, other show that's up, Susan Phillips, um, Seven Tears. So if you haven't had a chance, please come back. And uh, thank you so much to Allegra and Sarah for being here today. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you. Such a pleasure. Thank you.